So we're going to stream it on YouTube. But you guys won't be seen because I'll be sharing my screen and I'll highlight myself as the speaker, which is always lovely. <laughs> um, so, you know, you can turn off your camera by all means. You probably should um, mute yourself, you know, while we're on, just in case if you're eating or drinking or moving around or the TV comes on that we don't hear you. And, oh, there you go. See, <laughs> there's a horrible echo because it goes back and forth. So just give me uh, one more second now. I had another participant come in. Judy. Okay, so I, I am actually ready. I know it looks like I'm not. And then the last thing I wanted to do was post this on Facebook. Jeannie Mac, lads. You know, it doesn't get any easier, I have to say, this uh, hybrid thing. And of course, now we've had a couple of weeks off, you nearly forget what you're doing too. So just give me one second. Um, we are live. Okay. We are live on... So anyway, thank you all for tuning in. And I, as I say, this tonight, I'm going to try and cut it down as we're in process because I'm. Uh, it's a long one, and I it shouldn't be that long. <laughs> so, um, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for for joining us. It's great to see some of you back again. Uh, we haven't had one of these live ones in a long time. We we kind of have swapped to webinars and all kinds of things. Um, so tonight we're dealing with January 1922. Uh, which is, you know, we were just having a little chat before we went live. Um, very, very active time. There's a lot going on. And Alice, as I said there, there's a spotlight theme. We start with the YouTube and then we'll go away. So, my notes are amazing. Hopefully, the PowerPoint is some way matches up. But, alright, it started by doing the two things in the city. So, you can come out of the base. And, and then we'll have over there. Now, don't forget we have a lot of well, three more events this month. And next week, I, I just hate to introduce... The audio is bad. Uh, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth. Oh, the you know what? I'll plug in my... Um, I, mo I might be blocking my own microphone, so let me just get an extra room. Hang on, hold it. might be blocking thanks for telling me Jack. blocking my own microphone now is that better definitely oh yeah good okay yeah i'd say wherever i put my notes i'm probably blocking the mic so you can uh yeah so it, we have some other events i i filmed this morning with turtle bunbury so he'll be on next week if i could find my calendar i'd be able to tell you um that is going to be on the 19th and then on the 26th for members only we have MacDara. Uh, he's going to give us a lecture about life on the Aran Islands and Irish music and culture all that kind of thing it's it's to tie in with we have a fantastic Cora display uh, an actual boat but also an exhibition about life on the Aran Islands and Blasket Islands and all that and then we're showing a film on the 31st for Bloody Sunday, hoping that the numbers, you know, kind of get controlled. It's the 50th anniversary coming up of Bloody Sunday. But on Monday, the 24th, we have uh, an Irish writer who will talk to us. Her uncle was one of the first killed in, in that Bloody Sunday of 1972. So just stay tuned on our website. But anyway, I'm going to start now, finally. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Oh, hang on. What are you? Yep, the sound is much better. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll start to share this now. Share. All right. So, um, so we finished last month uh, with the stress of the actual signing of the treaty uh, in December, uh, early December there. And then the first kind of several days, it was almost two weeks of debate uh, in the Dáil privately with the cabinet and then in the wider doll where the old chestnut uh, you know as I call it of the the, the, the potentiaries and their status was debated uh, among other things despite de Valera arguing for the debate to continue through Christmas Michael Collins successfully argued for an adjournment over the Christmas holidays and the deputies went home then on December 22nd while it's difficult to know if some deputies changed their mind over the holidays although it would indicate you know there was kind of unofficial tallies going on amongst the party members and some of them did 
think at the time, you know, that the, the anti-treaty side would win. Uh, we know for sure, like two or three guys did not vote. Drone, especially in Tipperary, decided not to vote when he came back. In fact, he resigned. Uh, so something happened over the holidays while people spoke to their constituents and the Sinn Féin and IRB people on the ground. And so maybe this, you know, how easy would it be to ratchet back up into war might have given them an insight, you know. Um, certainly the bitterness of the civil war is presaged in, these, in this um, treaty debate. The poll also of the patriotic dead hung over uh, the debate. Of course, they could no longer speak for themselves, but plenty invoked their names. Uh, Michael Collins, in fact, was so exasperated at one point that he said deputies have spoken about whether dead men would approve of it. And they have spoken whether children yet unborn would approve it. But few have spoken of whether the living approve it. So an interesting take. Uh, the press were on them, and not only the Irish press, but the, the international press. You can see there, sorry, that was, I think, a paper in, in, in America, Liberty Day in Ireland, and that showed um, Sinn Féin, as it calls them, following the signing of the treaty in England. So that's, you know, Liberty Day, uh, fairly strong kind of words. So most of the press appeared uh, to be confident that the treaty would pass, or certainly they were confident that the will of the people of the country would be that the treaty would be passed. The Freeman's Journal um, expressed its confidence in the plenipotentiaries and their willingness, its own willingness to back them. Let them know that the nation's trust in them is complete and that they will not merely be honored with the nation's acceptance, but backed by its full strength. Now, in one sense too, even though it was an incredibly uh, dramatic time and a, and a kind of a historic time, the debate actually kind of dragged on. It was historic, of course, and emotionally charged at times, but reporters struggled to restrain their frustration at how protracted everything was, the repetition of some of the arguments, and the poor quality, to be honest, of some of the contributions. I had statistics earlier on, and I, I forgot to jot them down, like in terms of the hours, you know, like Countess Markievicz and De Valera had something like 300 and something interjections, you know, and how long different people spoke for. Um, the Irish Times called it the most wearisome debate in history. <laughs> uh, the Irish Independent said the people are become tired of the numerous and elaborate speeches at the Dáil, especially as many of them have failed wholly to grapple with the realities of the situation. It is about time that the debate was wound up and a division taken. So at that point, which was the 5th of uh, January, the, between private and public settings, the Dáil had sat for nine days with at least 53 speeches delivered publicly. Half of the members had already spoken, says the Independent. In no deliberative assembly in the world would half the members consider it necessary to speak on any issue. The impatience of the press stemmed in part maybe from a belief that the will of the people was evident and that the Dáil's job was to give voice to it. Why delay, asked the Independent, when it was an incontrovertible fact that the people are unanimously in favour of ratification. Now, you know, there was no Quinnipiac poll done, so I don't know how they knew that. Um, on New Year's Eve in 1921, in the last editorial of the year, the Freeman's Journal called for ratification of the treaty by saying, unfortunately, there may be others who think they know better than the people what is good for the people. The militarist mind develops under such trials and tortures. On New Year's Day, the provincial papers in Ireland also overwhelmingly showed their support for the treaty. Um, there were editorials calling for ratification in Wicklow papers, Fermanagh, the Ulster Herald, the Anglo-Celt, the Clare Champion, Limerick's Leader, and the Echo. Then district councils across the country called for ratification. Um, in Bantry, the Guardians and the District Club, the, the county kind of the county council district opposed the treaty. Uh, in New Year's Day, then, did I pass? Here it is, yeah. New Year's Day in 1922. The New York Tribune uh, reprinted these cartoons of Mikey Collins that had appeared in the London Star. And the article described how years of strife might finally give way to an era of peace. The New York Herald on the same day published a grainy image, and I had it, but it was too bad to show you, of De Valera in Six Mile Bridge in Clare uh, watching a parade by the IRA. And don't forget when they broke up, De Valera said there was to be no speechifying over the holidays. So that was kind of interesting. Um, Finon Lynch and Patrick Cahill, who were TDs in Kerry, were making their way back up uh, to Dublin for the resumption. They were greeted by a group of Nafina, who were, you know, vaguely like the Boy Scouts, but slightly, you know, armed, and Common Amon with banners which stated no partition but unity in Ireland. 
And don't forget, like partition is absolutely a fait accompli. Like there's a government in the north of Ireland since 1920, you know, they're operating as a state. So this will tell you like what's going on, you know. Um, so according to the Irish Independent, which had taken a very strong pro-treaty stance, 272 public bodies in Ireland had voted in favour of the treaty, like all these county councils and district councils. They thought there was only five against the two in Bantry, two in Carasivine and Kerry, and one in Kilmallock. Now, the other side of all of this, of course, is violence is still happening up in the north, uh, particularly Belfast. Hugh Corr, a 14-year-old boy, was shot in the head by a sniper, and the bullet actually passed through his head and hit another one-year-old child, Samuel Campbell. Corr died of his wounds. Also killed that year, uh, that day, New Year, was William Tomlinson, Alex Turtle, and Alex Twittle. A private, E.J. Barnes of a, the North Norfolk Regiment, was shot dead, and he was the 50th person to die in violence on the streets of Belfast in just six weeks. Um, I showed you there. So that's Earth for Terrace. That it's now the National Concert Hall. If anybody has been there, but back in the day, it was University College Dublin. Um, it's just off St Stephen's Green, and this is where they have the meeting. I showed you a picture of the room in December. Um, so not fit for purpose, to be honest. It was a very narrow room, and it was long rather than wide. So the press were at the back; they couldn't really hear what was going on. Um, they had rented out, would you believe, the mansion hall for a, a Christmas market, and so where the where the Parliament normally met had a Christmas fair on in there and they had to go here instead. So you can just, this is a sense of the crowds outside the door of Eros for Terrace every day. And as I was starting to say, a lot of this was press from around the world, um, including particularly American press. So um, it looked like that the majority of the population were probably in favor of the treaty, but de Valera's supporters in the Dáil remained confident. So to interject kind of personally, the something that I find very striking about these debates is the personal animosity that's on display between some of the deputies. It's actually kind of breathtaking at times. And if you want to go on, I'll share it with you later on. The Oireachtas, uh, which is, you know, the Irish word for government, their website has the entire transcript that you can read. It's I mean, obviously, it's going to take you weeks to read it because it's hundreds of pages. But it's breathtaking sometimes, like what they call each other and, and just how petty and kind of nasty it gets, you know. And that leads, I think, to the second issue, which is the level of debate is, you know, surprisingly, I would say surprisingly, because some of these people are highly intelligent, like, but it's it's not there. Like they're not talking about partition. They're not even really talking about what's in the treaty. They're, they're more concerned with the fact that the treaty has been signed under what conditions was it signed, you know, were Collins and Griffith uh, traitors, they're more concerned with had the plenipotentiaries the right to sign it. So it goes back and forth on these semantic kind of issues, you know. Um, and as one person said, we all knew we were there to sign it and signing it doesn't mean anything because we had to come back and get it ratified by you guys anyway. So that's, you know, we've done what we were supposed to do. Um, De Valera yet again brings up document two, which I'll talk about maybe later on. And so the, the arguments against the treaty really were simply the fact that it was signed. No one really has a quarrel with its contents and nobody really brings up any specific discussions of what they should change or what to remove or what should be there instead. So, you know, the purpose of the debate you kind of wonder, was it just a little bit of a circular, you know, silo that they were in? Naturally, the parameters of Irish sovereignty and the relations between Ireland and the, and the empire um, dominate the discussion rather than an actual contemplation of partition, which is now a fact, you know, in Irish life, or no contemplation of north-south arrangements. One third of the, of the text of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which is quite a short document, don't forget, concerned the North in some shape or form. Articles 11 to 16 concerned the position of the uh, recently established state in relation to the Irish Free State, but that weighting was not reflected in the debates at all. Of the 338 pages in the official Dáil record, only nine of them address the issue of partition and the North. 20 TDs, 20 members of parliament, mention Northern Ireland in their contributions, the word republic is mentioned 1,200 times, oath is mentioned 698 times, and war is mentioned 991 times. Economic or economical or economy appears 52. 
Ulster is mentioned on 113 occasions, Northern Ireland on 25 and the sixth county 11. Notwithstanding then a popular belief to the contrary, the final agreement, don't forget, does not require the Dáil deputies to swear allegiance to the crown. The focus of the oath was to the constitution of the Irish Free State that had an oath of truth, faith and allegiance. And there was a requirement of fidelity to the crown, quote, in virtue of the common citizenship of Ireland with Great Britain and her adherence to and membership of the group of nations forming the British Commonwealth of Nations, which is the first time that phrase Commonwealth appeared. Oh, no, Duffy broke it down nicely when he said, I do not want to take an oath to any English king, but the sequencing matters. I say the first part neutralizes the second part because you're taking an oath of true faith and allegiance to the Irish state. So on the 3rd of January, here they are after two weeks of a break, which was badly needed, the treaty debates recommenced. A crowd of almost 3,000 people greet the TDs as they arrive. The largest cheer is reserved for Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera. At about 11 o'clock in the morning, TDs made their way into this makeshift chamber. Uh, it was noted that de Valera appeared in high spirits and Countess Markievicz was going to apparently speak that day. Now, my photographs are in all kinds of order, so don't worry about that. Ernest Bly gave a long and technical speech that day, urging TDs to ratify the treaty. Um, Frank Fahey was anti-treaty and he kind of engaged in this tit for tat with Arthur Griffith and Eamon Duggan and Kevin O'Higgins. Uh, uh, Michael Collins doesn't often reply. You, and to be honest, he's actually misses some bits of it. Like he's late for one particular day. Countess Markievicz insults him. Uh, we might come to it, I think, in my speech later on. But he tends to give very short, little almost under undertone sort of interjections, you know, rather than like rising to to um to address something whereas Griffith will stand and say like I have a point of order or I take issue with xyz uh, Brian O'Higgins told the doll I went to Clare on Christmas Eve fully satisfied in my mind that in opposing this treaty I was doing what was right a week later I came back from Clare doubly satisfied I was doing right JJ Walsh ended his speech with I once wanted to get across the river there was a bridge a distance up I asked someone what's the best way to get across well if you mean shortest most direct way jump in and swim. That is what the opponents of the treaty propose. George Nichols told the Dáil, it is our duty and our highest principle to accept the treaty and work it. In a short time, by working that treaty, of course, not only would 95% of the people be satisfied, but a 100%, the whole people of Ireland. Now, again, there's only 26 counties included in that. So, you know, he's a bit uh, ahead of himself. The Lord Mayor of Cork, Donal O'Callaghan, said, for my part, I am voting against the treaty. I cannot in conscience do anything else. He thought, however, that the people of Ireland should be given the opportunity to vote in a referendum. Countess Markievicz then began her memorable speech by saying, I rise today to oppose with all the force of my will, with all the force of my whole existence, this so-called treaty, this home rule bill covered with the sugar of a treaty. Markievicz, let me just find her picture. I put her in there. There she is, small, tiny picture. Markievicz opposed any potential overt influence of Southern Unionists in an Irish government. She, of course, was a, a socialist. She worked with James Connolly and, and approved of his idea of a workers' republic. And uh, TDs interrupted her by shouting, oh, you want a Soviet republic. Markievicz warned, don't trust the English with gifts in their hands. That's not original. Someone said it before of the Greeks, but it is true. English come to you today offering you great gifts. I tell you this, these gifts are not genuine. She said they subjugated Wales by giving them a Prince of Wales, and now they want to subjugate Ireland by a free state parliament and a governor general at the head of it. And then she made this statement. I hear that Princess Mary's wedding is to be broken off and that Princess Mary is to be married to Michael Collins, who will be appointed first governor of Stair Thought Erin. She concluded her speech with Ireland's freedom is worth blood and worth my blood, and I will willingly give it for it. Stand true to Ireland, stand true to your own. I couldn't get it to connect the other day. Um, and put a little trust in. Oh, well, um, you'll have to. Am I still there? Yeah, that's OK. Um, she, what did I say? Uh, Stand true to your, stand true to Ireland, stand true to your oaths and put a little trust in God. 
Now, Marcus, I had said to you a minute ago, Michael Collins wasn't there when she made that Princess Mary joke. And of course, this was a kind of a, a little dig that, you know, there was whispers about Hel um, Lady Lavery over in England, a couple of other women, you know, there certainly he had been socializing while I stayed at Cadogan Place. Um, he returned and said that he had heard she'd made this comment and he mentioned her own constituents. Uh, he said, I do not come from the class that the deputy for the Dublin division comes from. I come from the plain people of Ireland. Um, he said that he felt very kind of put out uh, really on behalf of his own, that a woman had been insulted, you know, uh, and that no woman has ever been insulted in Ireland. And he mentions publicly for the first time that he's engaged to Kitty Kiernan. And so this is not only disrespectful to Princess Mary, but also to his own engagement. Um, you know, they, and they brought up in those same kind of speeches, this idea of the overspending that had gone on in England. I think I told you, you know, there apparently was a bill for 500 pounds for alcohol and chocolates and all this kind of stuff. But I don't know if when De Valera was in America, staying in the Waldorf Astoria, was there that careful accounting of what his money had been spent on, you know? So uh, these are just little things that pop up <laughs> when I'm looking at the debates. Pierce Beasley spoke in favor of the treaty uh, let me just go back here because some of them are, you know, in it. He concluded his speech, which had begun in Irish, which very few of them did, of course, before continued in English. He said, seize this chance to realize the visions of Thomas Davis, of Rooney and Pierce, of a free, happy and glorious Gaelic state. Art O'Connor said, it is a step off solid rock. You are in the swamp and you will be swamped. Michael Collins said in an undertone, I was often in a swamp and I did not get many people to pull me out. O'Connor concluded that the treaty would surrender the sovereign independence of Irish people. Um, so they come the next day, the morning of the 10th, which is the sixth public meeting. Everyone appears tired this morning and kind of strained. Owen McNeil, uh, who was count, the speaker of the house, basically, Cowan Corla, took his seat at 11.10 and they weren't all present at the time. And then on this day, Margaret Pierce, um, and I think I might have mentioned her before, Margaret Pierce gives her speech. She said that um, she refutes claims that her son Padraig would have accepted the treaty. She said neither he nor his brother Willie would accept it, and that if she were to vote to accept it, their ghosts would haunt her. She concluded her speech with, in the name of God, I will ask men that have used Padraig's name to use it in honor, to use it in truthfulness, I feel that I and others have a right to speak in the name of their dead. Liam Mellows then gave one of the most passionate anti-treaty speeches. He said, in the people's minds, there is only one alternative to, that, to this treaty, and that is terrible immediate war, which was the phrase Lloyd George had used. That is not the will of the people. That is the fear of the people. Desmond Fitzgerald asked, do TDs asked the TD, sorry, does Spain ever consider going to war continually over the single issue of Gibraltar, which he says interferes more with Spanish sovereignty than the, the treaty would interfere with Irish sovereignty? Oh, no, Duffy was sitting next to Michael Collins and he, gave, he spoke in favour. He said, neither party has a monopoly of patriotism, neither party has a monopoly of principle, and neither party can claim to be the sole custodian of the nation's honour. Alex McCabe, then I had a picture. Yeah, Alex McCabe um, rose. He was from Sligo and he made a long speech in favor of ratification. He spoke about the folly of principle, citing the example of the Great War when millions of people died because of a principle. He said, on principle too, Miss McSweeney would have whole populations of Ireland wiped out of existence, man, woman and child. She would not leave us even a grasshopper. Unsurprisingly, Max Sweeney took issue with his comments. He went on to say, think of the millions of wives and mothers and sisters who are waiting expectantly for peace. Countess Markievicz interjected, don't speak for the women. McCabe replied, I know what the women want just as well as the interrupter. <laughs> Ada English denounced his comments and said it was a most unworthy thing for any man to say here. I can say this freely because I thank my God, I have no dead men to throw in my teeth as a reason for holding the opinions I hold. And that I have to just interject here. Uh, you know, I told you at the start in at the last day in December, Mary McSweeney gave the longest speech of any um, deputy. She spoke for two hours and 40 minutes. 
you know, she was chastised by her own side as well. Obviously, she was anti-treaty. All of the women are anti-treaty. Um, but a lot of the words you start to hear around women's involvement in these debates now are things like, you know, hysterical, emotional. Uh, and that's why Ada, Ada English was saying, like, I'm not talking about my dead son or my dead husband. I'm talking about, like, the, the principles of the thing. And in fact, historians have shown the women had read the treaty, like they knew what they were talking about, they objected to certain specifics, but they tend to get, you know, um, characterized as being very emotional speeches, when in fact, a lot of the men were quite emotional too. Uh, Seamus Burke gave the final speech that day, and then matters took a dramatic turn. De Valera rose to say that one of the reasons he did not go to London, because he did not want to give away the Republic. Now, that's kind of you know, the crux of the whole thing, right? Michael Collins replied saying, I protest against any insinuation that I have given away anything. I have been the custodian of the honor of the country and I have given away nothing. And then De Valera brings up document two. He stood to his full height with his head and shoulders bent forward according to one of the journalists and announced, I am responsible for the proposals and the house will have to decide on them. I'm going to choose my own procedure. Arthur Griffith stood, I submit it is not in the competence of the president to choose his own procedure. This is either a constitutional body or it is not. If it is an autocracy, let you say so and we will leave it. The other doc TDs were absolutely stunned. Um, both men are on their feet at this point. It's quite tetchy. And so they adjourn for the day. Now, it looks like um, oh, Griffith proposed formally just before the adjournment to ratify the treaty the next day. At that time, even though popular opinion seemed to be behind it, uh, they weren't sure. 68 TDs had spoken during the debates, 35 for and 33 against. And then we go to document two. So this is a small bit uh, complicated, but I just, I need to tell you about this. So document two was the alternative to external association that De Valera had been proffering under different kinds of guises since his own meetings in July with Lloyd George and again, after they, the delegates came back with the treaty, well, actually, before they came back with the last treaty, he and Childers um, drafted this document. The document makes no mention of a republic, but it also doesn't mention the crown, but it clearly stated in the opening line that all power in Ireland derived solely from the people of Ireland. De Valera felt this was important because it stressed the source of legitimacy for the new state was the Irish people, not the British state's concessions. De Valera thought that the difference between the treaty and his alternative was so small that the British would not go to war over it. And in fact, he actually did copy a lot of the treaty into his own document. But he felt the differences were significant enough to make, quote, all the difference in satisfying the aspirations of the country. This might have only simply been his own aspirations, though. What he was proposing was really nothing more than the idea of external association which had already been rejected at least three times by the British side. This external association was a de Valera device which would see a fully independent Ireland become voluntarily linked to the Commonwealth, but not a member of it. It was supposed to be conceived as a compromise between the dominion status offered by the British government and the fully separate Irish Republic. Uh, this had been set out, you know, as I say, back in the London Times, it was absolutely repudiated uh, by them. Now, he reintroduces this in the private session of the Dáil debates back in December. Then in a public session on the 19th of December, he, uh, he wanted document two treated as a confidential matter. So the Dáil had wanted to publish it. They wanted the Irish people to know what was in it. You know, he keeps kind of referencing it in, in debates, but the document was still secret. And he thought it should, in December, he wanted it to remain secret. Now in January, he's proposing to go public with it. Um, but Griffith gazumps him. And so he releases the text this tonight. They've had this heated debate. Griffith released the text to the press. Uh, even though... It was kind of obvious that De Valera wanted to revise the, the document a little bit. De Valera, or Griffith denied that he'd acted dishonorably or that he had betrayed a confidence. He said, I am content to let my countrymen judge. Putting into the public domain De Valera's document was intended to impress upon the wider opinion that the alternative to the compromises of the treaty was not a steadfast uh, refusal to compromise. 
It was just a different kind of compromise. And so Griffith said the difference between those, these two compromises was not a vital difference, quote, between Republic and Crown. It was the difference of the degree of recognition of the Crown. And Griffith said the people need to know, are they willing to break with you know, the British government and break with the treaty for this? The problem with document number two is that it was not what had been negotiated for those three months practically in London. The document agreed was the treaty. Alexander McCabe, who was the Sligo TD, said um, he was as opposed to the external association of document number two because it represented goods delivered but not promised to us. Goods that we know were never offered or indeed were seriously asked for before. McCabe said it was better to take these goods, the, the treaty, that we have rather than run the risk of war or chaos and all that it means on our people and the prosperity of our country. So um, e the pro-treaty Irish independent paper published document number two on page eight. And he, de Valera issued a statement the same night which, which unknown to him, like the treaty, the document number two was published and he issued a statement. His statement said, you are in danger, influence is more deadly to a nation faced by an enemy than a plague in the ranks of its army or at work against you. If you give way, you are undone. Now he was talking about a press that he felt was kind of pro-British. Um, in the meantime, the IRA kidnapped one of the journalists, <laughs> an English journalist, who were covering the treaty debate, a man called McKay from the London Times. And they held a gun to his head, pulled him out of the grocery store. Apparently they said, um, you understand there's a car outside and you, you have to come into it. And if you don't, by Jesus, we'll riddle you. <laughs> so they bring him down to Cork uh, and overnight, like he's held in Cork. And the next day it's brought up in the doll that this, like there's IRA violence who gave the sanction for that. Um, the same night, about nine TDs from both sides of the camp met in the home of Sean T. O'Kelly, trying to broker a deal which would allow de Valera and those who oppose the treaty to maybe abstain from voting or to somehow pass the treaty, but to keep de Valera as president um, and to allow that government to kind of proceed. So they actually do hammer out an agreement, Sean T. O'Kelly, Art O'Connor, Liam Mellows, Sean Moylan, PJ Rutledge, were all the anti-treaty guys. Joseph McGuinness, Patrick Hogan, Sean Hayes, and Ono Duffy were the pro-treaty guys. Um, Griffith and Collins privately, um, but certainly definitively sanctioned this. But when de Valera uh, found out about it, and don't forget like his document has been leaked to the press, blew up in a fury, swore, and rejected the plan. So this was the night of the 4th of January. Like there seems to be no compromise coming from de Valera. So the next day, the 5th, this, the document number two was out. Um, the Freeman's Journal hits the streets. So does the Irish Independent. Um, carrying both de Valera's proclamation, this warning to the Irish people, as well as um, document two. And there's even greater crowds outside for Terrace. They're blindsided. Uh, the TDs are blindsided by how anti de Valera the editorial in the Freeman's Journal is. The headline ran, Vanity of Vanities. The printed tirade suggested that he was unwilling to forgive Collins and Griffith and that he would sacrifice Ireland because of this. The Freeman's Journal also attacked Erskine Childers, who, you know, had been responsible for the gun running for 1916, but had always been seen as on the fence because of his, you know, British uh, kind of past. They said, Childers won his spurs as a fighter against the South African Republic. These are the men whom the Irish nation is to put aside, Griffith, Collins and Mulcahy. Um, Sean Etchingham reminded the doll that Arthur Griffith himself had described the Freeman's Journal 20 years earlier as a paper with an evil history. It has opposed every national movement until the movement became too strong for it. So they had to, um, shortly after convening the doll, they had to break up the, 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 they had to take an adjournment because the press were so cantankerous with what was happening and had so many questions. And so the, the speaker, Owen McNeil, had to kind of um, calm everybody down. That little party, the nine TDs that had met privately in the house before, went back outside to continue talking. And then Owen O'Duffy announced to the doll what they had met and what that committee had wanted to achieve. Um, 
and nothing kind of came of it. Then Owen McNeil read out the letter from Frank Drowan, who was the TD in Tipperary. He resigned. He said his local Sinn Féin branch had asked him to ratify the treaty, but he could not do so in good conscience. And so he left the doll rather than vote. De Valera responded to the Arthur Griffiths charge yesterday of being an autocrat. Um, and De Arthur Griffiths said, as president has spoken about document number two appearing in the press, I wish to say I am responsible for it. I handed it to the Freeman's Journal and the independent representatives last night. Um, apparently the room erupted. The Irish independent said never before in its checkered history has Dáil Éireann provided scenes of excitement, outbursts of passion and stormy protests such as we've witnessed today. Um, the doll resumed and discussion again over the Freeman's Journal article was ongoing. Harry Boland walked in. Now, where's Harry? There he is. Uh, he had arrived fresh off from America. And of course, he was an anti-treaty vote. Um, so things are a little bit tense. They've lost drawn from the, the anti-treaty side, but now they've gained Harry Boland. Uh, now they get word that McKay, the journalist, has been kidnapped. And he was released, uh, you know, somebody, you know, gets a word down to Cork to release him. Mm, uh, Cosgrave criticised the Freeman's Journal article, which attacked De Valera. Mary McSweeney, Richard Mulcahy, Michael Collins and others rise to agree with Cosgrave, showing the extent of the respect still held for De Valera. So, you know, nobody in the doll wrote that article, I suppose. Michael Collins wrote a short and emotional note to his fiancée, Kitty Kernan, saying, this is the worst day I have had yet. Far, far the worst. God help us all. On the 6th of January, almost all of the major American newspapers carry events from the treaty debate on the front pages. Um, this, of course, is the penultimate day of the debates. It began with a private session of the TDs where they have this lengthy debate about uh, the committee's progress. Like, is there some way where the anti-treaty TDs just abstain from voting and, you know, the government carries on as normal. Then De Valera basically drops everybody in it, stands up and says that he was going to tender his resignation. He said, the whole of Ireland will not get me to be a national apostate and I am not going to connive at setting up in Ireland another government for England. TDs adjourned at one o'clock and then they would have a, a public session again at 3 p.m. So he's tendered his resignation. No, there was no vote or anything taken on that. The doll reconvened at 3.20 for the three most heated hours in history of debate in the lower house. Eamon de Valera rose and gave his defining speech. Um, it was over three and a half thousand words long, and it was the longest uninterrupted speech of the debate. He opened with, when these articles of agreement were signed, the body in which the executive authority of this assembly and of the state is vested, became as completely split as it was possible for it to become. He noted as head of state, I cannot get further work done. I cannot have confidence in members of the cabinet. He intended to resign, um, would trigger the resignation of the entire cabinet. And if he was reelected, he said he would throw out that treaty. Michael Collins launched into a counter, uh, a counter to his speech. He said, we will have no Tammany Hall methods here. He asked De Valera, are you going to be held up by three or four bullies? Now, of course, he means uh, definitely Cahal Brewer and possibly Austin Stack, maybe Ch Childers. But the Tammany Hall is an interesting reference to American politics. And Harry Boland, his own friend, is just back from America. So, you know, I wonder, was it Boland he meant? McNeil demanded that Collins withdraw the term bullies. There was a full minute of entire silence while De Collins contemplated that and he said I can withdraw the term but the spoken word cannot be recalled is that right sir Cahal Brewer rose to say Collins was asked to withdraw the term bullies you have seen in the way in which he withdrew it I don't know to whom he referred when he mentioned this word bullies possibly he may have referred to me as being one of them Cahal Brewer added that he held that he held Michael Collins in high esteem so he did not take offense to being called a bully but he says the minister for finance says something about Tammany Hall methods I know nothing about them, possibly he does. There was this kind of back and forth bitchiness, you know, between them. And De Valera said, I am sick and tired of politics, so sick that no matter what happens, I would go back to private life. I have only seen politics within the last three weeks or a month. I mean, he should have been seeing them since the 1918 election, but anyway. Harry Boland told the doll, I presume the remarks of Collins were intended for me. I will say this. 
If he had had a little training in Tammany Hall and reserved some of his bullying for Lloyd George, we would not be in the position we are in today. Referencing Boland's comments, Michael Collins wrote to Kitty Kiernan again that night, I am afraid he was not so nice tonight. I'm afraid he isn't fair in his homecoming and what he said about our side today. He is working like the very devil against us. You know, and it's, it's those kind of personal relationships that are just disintegrating in front of our eyes, like that are so, I think, heartbreaking. Seamus Robinson launched into a tirade against Michael Collins. Suppose you knew such a man was not really such a great man and that his reputation and great deeds of daring were, were in existence only in paper and in the imagination of people who read stories about him. The weak man who signed certainly exists. I believe the reported Michael Collins didn't ever exist. Is there even an authoritative record of his, of his ever having fired a shot for Ireland? He concluded his anti-treaty speech with, finally, above all things considered, there is a prima facie case, I think, for the charge of treason against the delegates Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. So, you know, uproar kind of in the chamber. At 7 p.m. that night, Dáil Éireann adjourned for what would be the final time pre, uh, the, pre the vote. At this point uh, in the tally is 39 have spoken for the treaty, 37 are against, and 45 TDs have not spoken at all. The final day of the debates, uh, they file into the university chamber, a um, lot of short speeches from people who had not talked at all yet. Um, the, there's kind of this volatility you can see in the room, PJ Ward and Dan O'Rourke, for instance, um, some of the, I, I'm going to, sorry, I interrupted myself, some of the, on this late breaking kind of day, some of them change their vote, even as they're coming in. So for instance, it was reported that Mac Patrick McCarthy, McCartan, who was the TD for Lee Shoffley, would not vote. Now he actually did eventually vote for the treaty, but it was reluctantly. He, PJ Maloney from Tipperary and Frank Fahey in Galway were somewhat indefinite. They voted against, as it happened. And I told you about Frank Drone, who refused to vote because he did not want to vote yes, and his constituents had said that he should ratify the treaty. Um, so there, this whole idea still of you know keeping De Valera as president, they had never voted on his first um, offer of resigning. That nothing happened there, and then Arthur Griffith. Uh, spoke in defense of Collins and he said that he was the man who won the war. Don't forget yesterday, uh, Robinson had kind of slurred him. Cahal Brewer stood because he wished to correct the record. Uh, and he said, um, Brewer insisted Collins was no more, quote, than a subordinate in the Department of Defense. Now, of course, he was, you know, chief intelligence officer of the IRV, so it didn't really matter what the Department of Defense was doing. Uh, there was cries of shame in the chamber as Brewer jealously added that Collins alone had been specially selected by the press and the people to put him into a position which he never held. He was made a romantic figure, a mystical character such as this person certainly is not. The Irish Times described Brewer's performance that day as an extraordinary object lesson in psychology because he hardly showed a trace of feeling of any kind during his long speech. Rather than win crucial votes, it has been speculated that Brewer's contribution may have cost um, some votes to the anti-treaty side. So it was left to Arthur Griffith, the chairman of the Irish delegation that had negotiated the treaty to wrap up the case for acceptance. Griffith made clear that the plenipotentiaries had been sent to London to make, quote, some compromise, bargain or agreement, and not to demand a republic. Had they attempted to do so, he said, the negotiations would have been over before they'd begun. As we know from the six weeks of correspondence all through September. The treaty Griffith confessed could have been better, but look what it had done. It had, quote, driven the British army into the sea. It had given Irish people the chance to live their lives in their own country and to take their place amongst the nations of Europe. Uh, Harry Boland stood, if we reject that treaty, England will not make war on us. And if she does, we will be able to defend ourselves as we, has, as we have always done. Suffice it to say, Harry Boland had been living high on the hog in America since 1920, so I'm not sure what fighting he was talking about doing. Um, Thomas Hunter, who was one of the photographs I showed you earlier, he gave his speech in four sentences. I rise to say a few words. Perhaps if I did not do so, some people might say that I had not the courage to voice my opinions in this assembly. 
I vote against this treaty because I am a Republican elected on the Republican ticket. I came here and I took the oath to the Republican government and I am not going to destroy that government. If the people do not agree with me, they can get rid of me at any time and in any way they like. Finally, as a Republican, I could never recognize the government of George V of England in either internal or external association. Um, Dan O'Rourke, a Roscommon-based TD and future GAA president, confessed that he would have opposed the treaty had the vote been called before Christmas. But what made him change his mind? He said, I returned to my constituency at Christmas and I went to the people, not the resolution passers, to the people who had been with me in the fight, the people whose opinion I value, the people who are, I believe, diehards. And I consulted them about this question and I must say, unanimously, they said to me that there was no alternative but to accept the treaty. Everything that is personal in me is against this treaty. I yield to no man in my hatred of British oppression and in my opposition to any symbol of British rule in Ireland, but I say I would be acting an impertinent part by putting my own views and opinions against the views of my best friends, the men who were the best fighters with me. Um, so I told you Carl Brewer's speech, that speech kind of denigrating Michael Collins went on for 80 minutes. Um, so the doll broke up after that speech for, for about half an hour. Uh, somebody from the Chicago Tribune asked De Valera's mother in New Jersey for her reaction to the fact that her son had attempted to resign as president a few days earlier. She said she was not surprised and she was happier he resign and keep a clean conscience and fight for a free Ireland. Uh, Griffith, uh, when, De when Brewer went on his tirade and Robinson, Griffith had said, if my name is to go down in history, I want it associated with the name of Michael Collins. Michael Collins was the man who fought the black and tan terror for 12 months until England was forced to offer terms. And he concluded with, I say now to the people of Ireland that it is their right to see that this treaty is carried when they get for the first time in seven centuries, a chance to take their place amongst the nations of Europe. When the Dáil reconvened at 8.35 p.m., Michael Collins said, let the Irish nation judge us now and for future years. Owen McNeil, the speaker, rose and said, we will take a vote now in the usual way by calling the roll. Uh, the vote is one motion on motion by Arthur Griffith, the Dáil air and approve of the treaty. Dear Matt Hagerty uh, took the roll as a hushed silence came over the packed room. He called out their names in Irish. If they were in favor of the treaty, they were to reply Isthal, and if they were not, they would say Nithal or Nihal. Of course, the first name was Arma, which was Michael Collins, or Mihal Aquilain, and he replied Isthal. Art or Griffith, or Art Griffith, Arthur Griffith was next in favor, and then they went down through it alphabetically. Um, after the final vote was cast, there was complete silence in the room, except for the furious scratching of pens as people tallied the votes. Just before the speaker could rise, they could hear cheering from outside on the street. At 8.45, Owen McNeil announced, the result of the poll is 64 for and 57 against. That is a majority of seven in favor of approval of the treaty. That's Collins leaving. And I just want to show you this picture. This here is De Valera with his head in his hands after the vote is called. So you can get a sense like, you know, how tiny the room is. But there is De Valera with his head in his hands. Um, 121 relatively young TDs, their average age was 38, had just decided the fate of the treaty. There was very little sign, mind you, or reason for jubilation at the result. Michael Collins stressed that the result did not represent any kind of triumph of one side over the other, and he impressed the need for unity and the preservation of public safety. Mary McSweeney, however, was in no mood for conciliation. The vote, she asserted, was the grossest act of betrayal that Ireland ever endured. As grown men and women wept around her, she was furious at the result and told the doll, I tell you here, there can be no union between the representatives of the Irish Republic and this so-called free state. De Valera, whom Collins was very careful to laud in his post-vote remarks, in fact, Collins said he has exactly the same position in my heart now as he always had, De Valera asked that those who had sided with the established republic would come together the following day at the mansion house. Um, the official record of the debates revealed the personal toll that the debates had taken on his personality. So accustomed to unquestioned deference, De Valera said, I would like my last word here to be this. We have had a glorious record for four years. 
It has been four years of magnificent discipline in our nation. The world is looking at us now. And he broke down and couldn't continue. He put his head in his hands and, and wept. And he was not alone. The greatest schism in Irish politics was complete. Now, Collins said, uh, de Valera said the Irish Republic had been established and could only be disestablished by the Irish people. Collins said, we should unite on this, that we will all do our best to preserve public safety. He said, in, in all countries and times of change, when countries are passing from peace to war or war to peace, they have their most trying times on an occasion like this. Whether we are right or whether we are wrong, we now are entitled to a chance. Uh, news of the ratification in Cork came with the publication of an extra edition of the Irish Echo after 9 p.m. Um, they interrupted a performance of a pantomime in the Cork Opera House to tell the news to tumultuous applause. A telegram from the Press Association in Cannes stated that Lloyd George, and don't forget Westminster had approved the, the treaty in two days back in December, uh, can Lloyd George was attending a conference, was satisfied with the results from Dublin. Winston Churchill told a journalist he was delighted the treaty was ratified. American newspapers, there's Michael Collins and the Gresham late that night after it. Uh, American newspapers were able to carry the news of the result, uh, but several had speculated that the treaty would be ratified. The result of the vote was broadcast wirelessly. The White Star Lines RMS Celtic received the transmission and announced the result to passengers. Over a thousand telegrams left the Dublin Telegraph office to places all over the world. Half a million words were sent from that office over the past few days as news of the ratification of the treaty was relayed. And crowds cheered uh, the shaken TDs as they left Earlsford Terrace. Broader public, the broader public in Dublin became aware of the result in a stop the press edition of the Saturday Herald. News made its way across Ireland. So people seemed to be delighted in Mountjoy prison, the, the amnesty they thought would happen. 300 prisoners packed their bags thinking they'd be given amnesty, but nothing happened yet. Um, the Sunday morning papers published in-depth accounts of the ratification and of the treaty. Uh, De Valera and his supporters had left, of course, they had met and had their own meeting on the 8th of January. Arthur, Co Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins, Eamon Duggan, Fanon Lynch from Kerry and other meeting pro-treaty TDs met in the mansion house and they were cheered. Uh, De Valera made the first public comments at a reception for Australian Catholics. He said, a solution for sovereign statehood has been brutally turned down, but the fight has to go on. Uh, now, so I want to get to this on the 9th of, so like they're back in session, the 9th of January, uh, the animosity between Cahill Brew and Michael Collins again boils over. Collins says, is it not better to have a signed check than an unsigned check? Brewer replies, yes, but the money mightn't be in the bank after you endorsing it. Michael Collins urges the TDs to stop talking and get on with the work. We are faced with the problems of taking Ireland over from the English, and they are faced with the problem of handing Ireland over to us. And the difficulties on both sides will be pretty big. And De Valera tenders his resignation. I wish to place my resignation in the hands of the assembly. I think it is not necessary to add any further words, but simply to resign my office. Um, he referenced the Irish volunteers split in 1914. He said that Redmond supporters were told that they would need them. And he said, I tell you now, you will want us yet. Michael Collins said, we want you now. Kathleen Clark, almost immediately after he resigned, proposed the re-election of de Valera. For this reason, she said, he is the one man to my mind who has maintained in act as well as in mind the Republic. I have great pleasure in proposing him for re-election as president. Liam Mello seconds the re-election. He says de Valera believed in the Republic and is a symbol of the Republic. As that symbol, he stood forth at the head of this nation, this nation which has gained unique position within the last few years. De Valera agreed he would stand. And if the House wished to reaffirm confidence in him by a vote, he would accept it and continue to govern as before. Uh, he said he would not advance the treaty if he was re-elected, but he would be happy to allow the deputies that had backed it to continue preparations for its implementation until the precise nature became clear enough for the people to vote and, in his opinion, reject it. But to elect de Valera now, uh, two days after they have voted to accept the treaty, Collins argued would turn the doll into a laughing stock. How could they give the backing of the leading opponent of the document that they had just ratified? 
Surely, he says, a vote for de Valera, notwithstanding his pledge not to actively interfere with the implementation of the treaty, would have effectively undermined, if not nullified completely, the treaty. Collins had proposed earlier that committee to ensure public safety, um, and de Valera wanted nothing to do with it then. And now, two days later, here he is basically proposing the same thing. He said the proposal to, or the proposal to re-elect de Valera as president of the Irish Republic was defeated by two votes, 60 to 58. Um, Robert Barton, who signed the treaty, voted for TD for de Valera. De Valera did not vote for himself, and Owen McNeill, the Speaker of the House, could only cast a, a vote breaking a tie. Two pro-treaty TDs did not vote, Liam de Rochta and Tom, Tomás O'Donnell. Immediately after that vote, where uh, de Valera lost, he said, I want all Ireland to know this vote is not to be taken as against President de Valera. There is scarcely a man I have ever met in my life that I have more love and respect for than President de Valera. Um, on the 10th of January, the next day, beginning 30 minutes late, Owen McNeill read out a congratulatory message from the Pope, uh, Pope Benedict, by a telegram. The proceedings opened with Michael Collins moving in motion that Arthur Griffith be appointed president of Dáil Éireann. The reason I do this is that the Irish nation is at the present moment a ship without a captain. Collins tells the T... Uh, yeah, don't mind that. Uh, there was all this back and forth. Uh, Sean Etchingham kind of accuses him of leaking the stories to the, to the Freeman's press and all this. He finally, Griffith, lost his composure, banged on the table, and he shouted at Ers Erskine Childers, I will not reply to any damned Englishman in this assembly. Now, don't forget, tension between them had been tough all during the London Treaty Talks as well. Childers replied that if he had only banged his table before Lloyd George, they mightn't be in this situation. Uh, replying to Childers' quip, Griffith, referring to his own na to Childers' nationality, said, I banged the table before your countryman, Lloyd George. Countess Markievicz then said, well, Griffith is a Welsh name. Like, see, this level of immaturity, you know, is unbelievable. So they have, uh, they take a vote for the president, but just before it is called, de Valera says, as a protest against the election as president of the Irish Republic, of the chairman of this delegation, I, while the vote has been taken as one, am going to leave the house. Uh, de Valera led a walkout of his supporters from the Dáil, so... Um, he said, I regret more than I can express the fact that I cannot consistently and sincerely congratulate President Griffith on his election. I regret it, as I say, more than I can express. So I've, I've put up, these are the, the minutes from the doll while they're leaving. De Valera supporters did not exit quietly and the insults were traded on both sides. An angered Michael Collins labelled them deserters all, deserters to the Irish nation in her hour of trial. David Kent shrieked up the Republic, and the departing Countess Markievicz let fly with oath breakers and cowards, Lloyd George Ites. Uh, when they went outside, de Valera and the other anti-treaty TDs were filmed and photographed. So sorry, there's some of the press. Uh, and I just want to get... I'm going to show you this film real quick. So there's no sound. This is, I think it was supposed to be from um, the British Pathé. Yeah, here we go. So this was the ones who had, this is Griffith and his crew. There's Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith look on the front row. William Cosgrave. And then um, here's that same picture. So this is the, the free state government, as we'll call it now. The, these are the ones who voted yes. There's Ernest Bly. Uh, and then this is the cabinet. I'll, I'll come back to the cabinet. And then here's de Valera. They've just walked out. So you can see all of the women are with him, the six women, which, of course, he does nothing for women in his own doll, but that's a question for another day. Uh, here they are. This famous image shows de Valera and his ministers. That's the de Valera and his ministers and all of the group in front of a tricolor, which is held by Sean McSweeney. So Cam is restored inside in the room. And the shrunken gathering elect Griffith as president and a core team of ministers. Uh, Griffith was elected unanimously and he said, Dahl, uh, he said, the Dáil and the Republic exist until such time as the Free State Government is set up. I intend that the Irish people shall have the fullest power of expression at election. Uh, Griffith was one of three former ministers who remain in the cabinet, Collins and Cosgrave, who retained their portfolios of finance and local government. Gone, of course, with de Valera was Carl Brewer, Austin Stack and Robert Barton. And now in their place came Richard Mulcahy, 
who have, had been the chief of staff of the IRA. He's now the Minister for Defence. George Gavin Duffy is Minister for Foreign Affairs and Eamon Duggan is Minister of Home Affairs, while Kevin O'Higgins is Minister for Economics. Um, in a show of lasting reverence and respect for de Valera, Griffith said that he will still call his fellow TD President de Valera and he thanked UCD for the use of their building for the previous few weeks and Dahl Aaron adjourned for a month. Uh, now, the appointment of this cabinet formalized the debate, uh, the divide, sorry, that the treaty debates had helped to expose. And it emphasized the sundering of a unity that had marked the rise of Sinn Féin really from 1905, but certainly from 1917, 1918, when it became this umbrella organization in that election. Um, so Sinn Féin had kind of had been a big tent, you know, up until this signing of the treaty. The rupture, of course, set in turn a series of events that leads perhaps inevitably, but certainly ultimately to a bitter and destructive civil war that left a defining and a deep impression on the political culture of the Irish Free State. In time, at least for the 26 counties, the treaty did in fact act as a stepping stone to full independence that the proponents, particularly Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith had hoped, but the, the Boundary Commission, of course, is a complete failure. And that meant the permanent, uh, at least until now, partition divide between North and South. Now, the last thing I want to show you is um, January 16th, the other, probably it's the Irish Independent described it as the most significant event in Irish history for hundreds of years, which happened on a cold Monday morning at Dublin Castle. Well, this, so I just want to show you this too. That's Carl Brewer, Luck and De Valera after they've walked out. There's no sound with any of these videos, but it's just interesting to see their faces, you know. And this little old lady in the background with the shawl. <laughs> you know, it's a very mixed Ireland. Look at that, like, the, you know, the children and this old lady. Okay, why are you not moving on? So Dublin Castle. Uh, at 1.45 on the 16th of January, the machinery of government and the castle itself, this is photograph is from the 1950s when they were renovating it. But this room, I think, is where most of the action today happens. Uh, the castle itself were formally handed over by the last lieutenant or the viceroy of Ireland to the new provisional government. Represented certainly in Michael Collins, if any of you have seen that film or in other things, as a kind of a colourful ceremony. And there's supposed to be this funny quip about Michael Collins you know, being seven minutes late. And, and he said, sure, you have it for 700 years, um, which apparently didn't happen. It was quite a short and unimpressive event, really. From an early hour that day, crowds gathered outside the castle gate uh, on Palace Street in anticipation of the events. And by noon, thousands had assembled, stretching in each direction along Dame Street. The handover was supposed to take place at 12 o'clock, but Michael Collins was, uh, had been away from Dublin and he was late. Events were delayed by an hour and a half. So that's why they think that seven minute story didn't really happen. The provisional government, which were based, of course, in the Mansion House, elected him their chairman. And at 1.20 p.m., they telephoned officials at Dublin Castle to say they were on their way. The representatives of the provisional government arrived in three taxi cabs at the gates of Dublin Castle at 1.40 to cheers from the waiting crowd. Collins was present. And with him were William Cosgrave, Eamon Duggan, Patrick Hogan, Finan Lynch, that Kerry man that we met a minute ago, Joseph McGrath, Owen McNeil, funnily enough, the speaker, there he is, and Kevin O'Higgins. A few minutes later, the Lord Lieutenant and Edmund Talbot arrived in a large car from the Vice Regal Lodge, which today is um, the Phoenix Park or the one where the president lives. He proceeded immediately to the Privy Council Chamber, where he received the members of the provisional government in private and handed over formal powers. The government members were introduced to the heads of the various departments before they left and went back to the mansion house. Their stay in Dublin Castle lasted 55 minutes. No press or photographers were present in the room, but as the Irish Examiner recorded, those curiously inclined were able to obtain a fair idea of what was going on in the Privy Council chamber because its windows look right onto the upper castle, upper castle yard. And as the room is lighted from both sides, the movings within could be followed with tolerable accuracy. The Viceroy stood at first at the fireplace at the northern end of the apartment. The seats on the right-hand side of the Lord Lieutenant's chair were occupied by Michael Collins and two of his colleagues. The Irish Independent added, through the windows, Mr. Collins could be seen smiling and looking absolutely self-possessed as he met the Viceroy. The official account of the handover released by Dublin Castle at 4 p.m. that day reads, 
in the council chamber at Dublin Castle this afternoon, His Excellency the Lord Lieutenant received Mr. Michael Collins as head of the provisional government provided for in Article 17 of the Treaty of 6th of December. Michael Collins handed to the Lord Lieutenant a copy of the treaty and other members of the provisional government were then introduced. The Lord Lieutenant congratulated Mr. Collins and his colleagues and informed them that they were now duly installed as the provisional government. He wished them every success in the task that they had undertaken and expressed the earnest hope that under their auspices, the ideal of a happy, free and prosperous Ireland would be attained. Once the treaty had been presented to the Viceroy, the members of the provisional government were introduced, as I said, to the different departments that oversaw the machinery of government. And after the, the Civil War and when Cosgrave sets up a government, most of those people are still there. So in fact, there's very little change in the running of the government. Uh, you know, this we could argue about that uh, at a later time. As the meeting uh, broke up at 2.25, Mr. Collins allegedly bounced out, and there he is, uh, through the Chief Secretary's doorway, and he pushed Mr. Duggan and Mr. Cosgrave into the leading car, evidently having seen sufficient phot photographing and filming during recent days. The Viceroy departed a short while later at three o'clock, and so ended the brief historic formality that was the official handing over of Dublin Castle and the Government of Ireland contained within it. On their return, an official statement was issued, signed by Michael Collins. It began, the members of the provisional government received the surrender of Dublin Castle at 1.45 today. It is now in the hands of the Irish nation. The statement went on to say that for the next few days, the functions of the existing departments of Dublin Castle will, will be continued without in any way prejudicing further action, future action. Little is known then about what was said uh, and who said what to whom during those brief 45 minutes. One anecdote describes that the Viceroy chastised Michael Collins to bring seven minutes late, but as I said, that seems unlikely because they were actually an hour and 40 minutes late. Um, another that Tim Pat Coogan wrote about said that uh, on arrival, Collins was greeted by James McMahon, the undersecretary with the words, we're glad to see you, Mr. Collins, to which he allegedly replied, yeah, like hell boy, in his Cork accent. In the absence of anything fir firmer than anecdote, of course, we'll never know for sure. We do know that on the Saturday before the handover, Michael Collins was reported as saying, I suppose our next step would be to walk into Dublin Castle, take possession of it and make a present of it to the Irish people. Collins wrote to Kitty Kiernan on this day, um, I am as happy a man as there is in Ireland today have just taken over Dublin Castle. He later recalled of the event, how could I ever have expected to see Dublin Castle itself, that dread Bastille of Ireland, formally surrendered into my hands by the Lord Lieutenant in the brocade hung council chamber on my producing a copy of the London Treaty. We had red carpets laid out for us on that momentous morning, and I recalled my only previous visit to those grim precincts as the driver of a coal cart, because he was sneaking in in disguise with Ned Broy, don't forget to look through the files, with a price upon my head. So who would have thought, you know, he would go from this double agent kind of mole to, uh, to taking over. That evening, the vice regal household released a telegram that the viceroy had received from King George V. It read, I am gratified to hear from your telegram of the successful establishment of the provisional government in Ireland. I am confident that you will do all in your power to help its members to accomplish the task that lies before them. George or I. The, vi the Viceroy himself remained the King's representative on Ireland until the end of 1922. But uh, there was a lot of work ahead of them. And of course, you know, January, it's looking fine. I told you, you know, violence is still happening in the North. We know that Collins and Craig start talks. Everyone is kind of hoping the, the Boundary Commission will happen. And uh, Collins and de Valera try to come to some arrangement because there's going to be elections in June. So um, I'll just show you this. This is the film of them, of them taking over Dublin Castle. Undramatic, but a, a moment that will live forever in Irish minds, probably true. So you can see there are some of the crowds, you know, they come in from that gate if anybody has been there. I mean, it's, it's fantastic footage. I'm so glad we have it. And then this is them coming out like there's no more, you know. 
So there's Collins. Yeah, he, he did kind of bounce out there as Owen McNeil. Um, so, you know, very kind of quick. And then there's the vice Roy himself leaving. So it's hard to know, really, you know, um, certainly I think, you know, you can kind of tell from how tense the debates get, even though everyone kind of pledges, you know, that they're on their best behavior and that they'll move forward kind of thing with the good of the country. Uh, we've seen like throughout this debate in December and January, and even though it's ratified by the government, like, you know, De Valera was talking right before the ratification vote, like that the fight would go on. So it's very hard, I think, to um, to know, you know, where, or at least to think, how were they going to not, how are they going to avoid a civil war? You know, that's, I think, the question. So if anyone has any questions or comments, I'll take them now. It was very long tonight. I'm sorry. I, I cut it down as I was reading, but it was, I couldn't cut it down <laughs> any more than I did. Because I, I think it's very important to have those back and forths, you know, like these kind of snarky comments and... And as well, just to show you the breadth of the, or I, I would say the breadth of the debate, I think I mean the narrowness of the debate, because they really don't talk about, um, you know, what could we do instead, or what are we going to do about the North, you know, so it's very interesting, I think, where the debate stalls. And as I say, I suppose civil war is inevitable, really, you know, from here. But yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments, fire away, you can unmute yourselves. I thought the comment uh, by, I believe it was Michael Collins, uh, as uh, De Valera and uh, his uh, a couple of people with him, he said, ah, there, there they go, uh, foreigners, Americans, and British. Of course, De Valera's American context is obvious. Why would he, why would he refer to the others as foreigners as uh, it would be, uh, or, or British, I wonder, because of their close sympathies, apparently? Well, sure. I mean, that's the thing. It is nearly the opposite of their sympathies. But Childers was certainly like he fought for the British in a war that a lot of Irish people fought for the Boers, for instance. Uh, now, changed his mind. He was the gun runner in 1914 with the Asgard, you know, and the IVF. Countess Markievicz, of course, is landed gentry, you know. So it's kind, of, you know, I think he's trying to say, perhaps unsuccessfully, because obviously they're Republicans, but you know, that he is just a kind of a normal run of the mill. He said it actually in response. I don't know how I managed to lose that. His response to Markievicz's speech, you know, was that no woman of Ireland should be insulted. And I'm not from the class that the, the Dublin um, representative is, even though she was, of course, from Sligo. Um, so I, I think he's kind of, it's a cheap jab at the fact that they are possibly Protestant, possibly of English, um, you know, heritage, but obviously they're Republicans. So... I don't know if it lands or not, John, you know, um, I mean, it probably does because mostly it, it's probably a dig at the fact that they're Protestant, you know, uh, but but clearly they're they are sympathetic to the Republican cause. Thank you, Rita. That's great. I know yeah, there was an awful lot in it. <laughs> you know, I would recommend if you can get in, I, I'll maybe try and post the, the Iraq, this treaty debate. I, I'll attach it to the Facebook page later on. There's weeks of reading in it like because they, they're there one after the other after the other. Um, and it has all the interjections and stuff, but it, it's very interesting reading. Um, yeah, and RT are doing a lot of work on it too at the moment, you know, kind of a, a breakdown. Like, I, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to watch how Ireland handles this commemoration. As I said, when we were chatting at the start, you know, I mentioned that my own family were not particularly uh, Republican or, or political at all, but it was very easy in 1919, 1921, to pick a side you know like there was you were fighting the good fight like if you we were fighting the black and tans it's very difficult now coming into 22 so it, like it has been very easy in one way to commemorate the war of independence at home it's it's going to be more complicated obviously to to deal with how do we commemorate you know the civil war because there's atrocities committed on both sides you know potentially you could argue is an atrocity worse when it's committed by the state as opposed to by like a paramilitary group, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about that myself kind of thing, but, uh, and I suppose what I sort of think about the civil war is that always hanging over their head was the threat that if they didn't get it under control, Britain would come back in and do it for them. You know, that's stated explicitly at the start before Collins decides to, to kind of take control. Um, so you wonder like, is that hanging over their heads too? And what would have happened if, if like, if we didn't have a civil war, 
would the British just have come back in, you know? So there's that kind of pressure on them as well. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? This, this, or mor- this morning I watched um, from a library in Dublin and it was called the handover of Dublin Castle and it was an oral history and they had, you know, this, this gentleman had um, interviewed these, these old folks, you know, these old men that were part of it. So yeah. it was really interesting. And then to have yours, to, you know, later today, it was really, it's a lot to absorb. Uh, you know, yeah, you've been really driven to from it, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny, like that the handover is such a small, you know, I mean, like the business of governing, of course, is different to these ceremonies, but like, you know, they're in, they're out in 45 minutes and it's all over, you know, and you kind of think, my God, this is 700 years of fighting over in a few minutes, you know. Right. Like the, and then and it was interesting to hear the, dramatic, you know, yeah. It was interesting to hear the oral histories, though, where these, yeah. you know, people that were actually there talked about it, these older gentlemen. One of them, I had a very hard time understanding them, but. Oh, the you know, but, <laughs> but uh, we, it was I good. And thank you. And your talks, that, your talks are always excellent. <laughs> thank you, Rita. I hope they'll archive that, though. We might be able to watch it later because, you know, it is. Like you saw there, the crowds, there's unbelievable, like hundreds of people outside every day outside the Earl's Fort Terrace. And like, I kind of flipped through my slides quickly, but I, I had even more like, you should see that the newspapers in America that cover it, like, you know, papers in Utah, like in places that you would think have no interest in Ireland. Like it, it was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, the Lakeland news, like, and yeah, Utah, like, you know, now obviously places like New York and, and even Butte, Montana, right. like would be interested. But it's amazing how uh, this is front page news, like for days, you know. Uh, anyone else have a question or comment? I'm trying to see online too. Do we have someone? But I think we don't. So that's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're all, everyone is just overwhelmed. Oh no, Andrew says, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you too. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in it, you know, and I, I try my best. I, I think you can see where my own personal bias, you know, comes out at times, but, uh, and again, like I say this every talk, you know, looking back, hindsight is 2020. So you wonder in the heat of the moment, like, was it seen? And it, it must have been difficult. I, I know we, we hate to say the women, you know, using their dead, like, or, or are their speeches emotional? But like, I suppose if I had lost my husband or like Mary McSweeney's brother, you know, to die of starvation, I think it took 74 days to die on hunger strike in Brixton. Mm. Like, you know, is this what he died for? Is, is the sacrifice worth it? It must have been very difficult. Like, but again, I, I think the reality of the situation was that like the, the Republic was never on offer. It wasn't an offer in June when they had the truce. It wasn't an offer in July when De Valera went over there. You know, like this idea of Britain absolutely like washing their hands and cutting all ties. And again, don't forget, Northern Ireland is governing itself, you know, since 1920. So it was never as cut and dried as, as I think the kind of diehards believed it should be or could be, you know. Pat and Joe, are you getting ready for a question? Um, no, it was just uh, when you were talking about the women being um, overlooked and dismissed by the men. Um, that still happens nowadays. So, I know. You know <laughs> yeah, I know. Not much has changed. So. Yeah, well, you know, I, to be honest, what the, I think the worst betrayal of the women, to be quite honest, comes after like when their own crowd yeah. are back in power so they in a way you could argue it's kind of natural that they're sidelined in this next government and, and cosgraves come yeah. Wales government because they voted against the treaty so like they're not standing for election in fact i think they all lose election when they restand except for one mm. who wasn't contested mm. so first of all they did not make a popular choice you know let's be fair right. and they absolutely get hammered on the quality of their contribution you know, like in terms right. of, oh, the dead and my sons will haunt me and blah, blah, blah. They, they get hammered in that. But De Valera, like they should have been front and center of De Valera's government when he t- comes back into politics, like in 26, 27. And he doesn't nominate. In fact, he he inserts those articles in the constitution that delim- like limit a woman's place in the home and all this rubbish. We still have, I think it's article 41 uh, that, you know, they're trying to get rid of. So he, I think, absolutely betrays them. You know, these women that had fought alongside him, that had voted to renominate him, you know. And I, I have to say, lads, I think 
the one characterization that I keep seeing of De Valera here, like I just can't get over his own ego. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. I, it doesn't seem to me to be principles like, you know, at, at this point that like, oh, yes, you know, I'll resign. But if you want me, I'll go again. You know, like <laughs> I, I, because I, if you have the principle, then you you would stick with your resignation. Mm-hmm. Like you don't agree mm-hmm. with it, you know, and so. I, I think he just is power mad. And, you know, this is, he, he causes a civil war over an oath that doesn't exist. First mm-hmm. of all, there's no oath of allegiance to the king. And then in 1926, when he decides he does want to come in, he says, well, the oath is only an empty formula anyway. Like, why couldn't it have been an empty formula in January of 1922, you know? So I, I have a hard time with De Valera. <laughs> but, but, you know, maybe he was coming from the right place. I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, to give know, an idea, Tell yeah, me. Elizabeth. To give an idea how close it was, I'd never heard the actual tally, but a mere four votes would yeah. have it would have swung the other way, not yeah. not seven as it appears. No, exactly. And, I mean, that that's pretty. Oh, it's awful close. That's pretty significant in terms of principles of democracy and yeah. how how you would determine a majority. It's yeah. It's arguable that it was so close that it was. You, you know, either either side could be justified as to the people's feeling themselves. Yeah, well, I suppose, you know, so I, I was going to say two things. One is it is four is amazing because like Drohan doesn't vote and, you know, one or two others abstain or, or definitely Drohan resigns. Mm-hmm. I think two abstain. But the, I would say, Jack, what kind of ratifies it for me is the results of the general election in June. Mm-hmm. And so if you run the general election as a plebiscite on, on the ratification of the treaty, overwhelmingly, the people vote in favor of the TDs mm-hmm. who voted in favor of the treaty. And that's why the civil war is kind of a hard pill to swallow, because twice now they've lost a vote and they continue, you know, to kind of say it's subverting mm-hmm. the will of the people, you know, <laughs> so um, it's, mm-hmm. it's difficult, you know. So look, guys, we'll leave it there unless you have any other questions. I'm delighted to be back. This is a nice format. I, I, I had forgotten that we, for some reason, we were only doing it live on YouTube and we can't interact the way we are here. Uh, I hope everybody had a fantastic Christmas and a happy new yeah. year. <laughs> and uh, I know our COVID numbers are gone so high. My parents did visit, but we didn't leave the house in case they'd catch COVID uh-huh. and they couldn't yeah. leave again. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, that's good. You got to see them. I got to see them, exactly. So we just were lazy and you know hung out in my apartment and down here I, I showed them the museum. But um, yeah, it was a whirlwind five day trip of avoiding COVID so that they could test yeah. negative and go back home. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Well, so Happy New Year. I, and Happy New Year, exactly yeah, to yourself. Happy yourselves. New Year, everyone. I'll I look forward to being you. able to be in person again soon. Yes, exactly. So we're still hoping to show the film in person on the 31st. But next week on the 19th, we have uh, Turtle Bunbury's Irish Diaspora and Vanishing Ireland. <laughs> He's an author and historian. Very, very good. I'm going to try and get copies of the book in as well for the shop. Well, thanks all. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.